The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Joel, are you there? <laughs> I'm here. I thought you were, <laughs> thought you were gonna start. I just clicked the button. You start. <laughs> All right, everyone. This is Joel from Eduphoria. Welcome to our webinar. This is Wednesday, September 20th at 2 o'clock. And I am going to be hosting everyone today. And I have some guests with me uh, today presenting. So uh, there's my picture. I'm the one on the right, not to be confused with Eloise on the left. <laughs> Eloise, say hello to everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. And we also have Michelle. You heard her voice. Michelle, you want to say hi again? Hi again. She would not let us put a picture up here because she doesn't have her <laughs> professional headshot yet. But uh, coming into this as um, a former Eduphorian, our topic today is about for new Eduphorians. I have experience as an Eduphorian in districts where I have worked, and Eloise has also been an Eduphorian in, in the district where she has worked as well. So we're coming to you with knowledge from our background to help you with your implementation as well. So this is what we're going to cover today. Our first thing is we're going to, of course, welcome all of our Eduphorians. Uh, we're going to go over all the support and training resources that we have available. We're also going to go through our help web page, get you accustomed to navigating our help resources. We're going to go through the Eduphoria management setup, the things that should be done at the start of the school year. And then we're going to go through some of our software, just some initial setup, some uh, things that are happening in, the, in those systems as well as we continue through this presentation. We have a questions window that's part of this webinar, part of all of our webinars. If you have any questions about our current topic, what we're talking about today for new Eduphorians, you can add those to the questions window. When I'm talking, uh, Eloise and Michelle are in there. They can answer those questions. And then as we rotate through our speakers, there will be someone in there to answer the questions you need answers to. Again, if you will stay on the topic of what we're focusing on here, it's going to help us. We'll, we'll kind of pause every now and then, check out the questions, see if there's anything we need to review that may not have been gone over, or if we need to review something that we did go over, we, we will do that. But if you have other types of questions that aren't associated with our topic, then we'll address those in training and support. So first of all, I just want to say welcome as being an Eduphorian, and that term is something that we define to the person at a district who is kind of the the one who is doing all the setup and is the point of contact for your district. And Eduphorians are like our, our groups, our people. Um, like I said, we have backgrounds where we were Eduphorians, and we understand the setup and the management and we're just so excited that you will be part of this webinar and part of the Eduphoria family. Um, I know that there are a lot of questions that take place at the start of school year, and especially those districts that are joining us that might have been impacted by Harvey or Irma, and your start of school might have changed a little bit because of the impact of the weather. Again, we're just so thankful that you're able to be here uh, with us and joining our family to help your, your districts as well. So let's just talk about ways that we can help you. Uh, we have support and we have training. And support is one of those areas where you would contact if you notice something isn't working correctly. And I put on here the information for how to contact these different entities, so support. You could actually contact by emailing support at eduphoria.net or calling with that phone number listed there. Training is going to be more of the questions of, I don't know how to do this, or I just need uh, guidance on trying this. And that's where you would contact training. You contact us by emailing training at eduphoria.net or entering that, that ticket as well. Whenever you're contacting us for support or for training, the details in those descriptions are really important. It's, it's, it's easier for us to kind of help resolve a ticket faster when they come into our system, whether through support or training, if we have specifics. So if you're, if you're having an issue with a specific teacher's account 
let us know that teacher and what campus they are at so that we can troubleshoot on our end before responding to your ticket instead of just saying, I have a teacher who can't do something and I need help. Uh, letting us know the specifics will help us figure out the right way to help you and to get your answers to you as quick as possible. Uh, we also have uh, our sales information is on here, so you can contact sales at eduphoria.net. If you need more information, you can see the phone numbers are the same for training and sales, uh, but that will give you to the right places, the right people that you need to talk to. And, and one thing I want to say about support and training. So even though these are separate departments, we all work together. Currently, with all the tickets coming in for the different applications, because it is the start of school and it's hectic everywhere, a lot of us trainers are going in and helping our support teams answer those tickets. So if it goes into support and it's more of a training ticket, we're able to pull those. The same if it's training and our, we need more help to answer the ticket, we also communicate with support. So I just want everyone to know, like, we really have a team-oriented service department in both our uh, support and training teams. And we do work together to make sure that we are providing the best support for all of our customers. Another area that you can get help is through our help resources. Uh, we use a, a tool called Zendesk. And you can access help. It's kind of small on the screen, but when you first log into Eduphoria, there's the help button at the very top of the screen. Uh, when you're in any of the applications other than Strive, the help button is going to be on the far right and at the top of the screen. And on the Strive application, it's actually on the left. And it's it's funny, as we do training, sometimes I'll tell people, you can want to go to help and I'll reach over to the right with the mouse and then remember I have to go way over to the left. But when you click on help, it will take you into our help website, which is full of all sorts of resource articles. This is what the help page looks like. And it's uh, able to sort by the different applications that you can click on. Um, there's also where you can submit a ticket that's a help ticket or a request for training. And I'm going to click out of here in just a second to show you what this looks like. But this is our help screen. It's also searchable by content, it has the search bar here. And once you create an account, once you first uh, submit a ticket, or if you do it by email, it creates an account for you. And then you can create an account to go in and track that information as well. So I'm actually going to just get out of the screen for a second and go to our help. Let me move this little bar over here. And this is the Eduphoria help. Again, I got to this by inside of the applications, clicking the help button. It takes me to the screen. I can see all the different types of help resources available. And I'm actually logged in. So you're going to see a few more windows that you will not have access to. These that say internal. I won't click on those because those are internal only. But all of our help is divided up by the software content. So I can click on any of these and to go into like a menu that we have divided up. We usually divide it up by the type of user. So like for Strive here, we have Strive for teachers and users. And all of these help articles, and there's even more I can click on here to view, are usually written for the language of that particular user. So in the case of a, a teacher user for adding new goals, and there's me. There's my little smiling face from that picture. Uh, <laughs> we have an embedded video, for example. This one has an embedded YouTube video here. We also have a link to a previously recorded webinar from August 10th. It's about goals. And then we have step-by-step -step directions with screen captures uh, detailing how to do whatever it is that that article is showing. And then on the left side of an article, it will show the other articles for that section. So it's just easy to go to the next one in that process to help with the training and to get the help that they need. And then if I go back to my main screen, again, I have that search bar. I can type in a keyword that I'm looking for. And we're doing a, a good job of tagging our articles. So when you just tag a specific word that you're looking for, it will pull in that information. Let me actually log out so we can see what this looks like to sign in. Oh, boy, that's always fun. 
And I think it's because I have too many of these little windows open. So here's the Edufori screen. If I'm not signed in, if I'm not Joel Adkins, who's done all these different training and articles, but I can click on the Submit a Request button here. And this is where you can put in your email address. This is how someone will be able to contact you with information to complete your request. A subject is helpful. The description, just like we said before, you want to enter details for your request. And then you can also select the category. The category can represent the specific application that you need help with. You can also add files. If you have a screenshot of an error, if you need to upload a document that shows more about what you're needing, you can put all that information in here and then hit submit. On this one, you don't have to be logged in. In fact, when you submit a ticket this way, if I go back to my sign in for uh, the sign in button, when it asks for your login down here, it says, are you new to Eduphoria? Or if you have emailed, it says, if you've already communicated with support through email previously, you have already registered. You probably just don't have a password yet. So then you can click this, get a password, and it will email you a password to let you log in. And that way you can track other tickets and see the progress of the tickets that you've submitted outside of what you're seeing and the emails that you're getting. And so that's going to be our help section. Let me go back here to, the, oh, I'm not going to go back to that screen. This is, again, where you can find all your various help articles. We do go in and update these. So as updates occur to our software, as new things are released, uh, we're able to create updated articles to help you navigate what those new tools are. So yes. I, I, would, I would like to add also, um, it's very helpful when our customers are utilizing our online help and there is an article missing or maybe doesn't match. Uh, their real kind is in sending in something like, I was looking for a monitor list and it's not matching. So we will update our online help at that time. Yes. And we, we are, uh, we, like, like she said, we are very interested in feedback from our customers. So if there's something that is needed, let us know and we will put articles in there to help out. Um, I believe, Michelle, you are going to be presenting next. Let me make you the presenter. Oh, no, stay where you are. Stay oh, where you are because okay. I have the slideshow up. <laughs> oh, yes, Thank you're right. Let's go back to the slideshow. So, yeah. Yes. Very good. All right. So let's talk about some. Thank you, Joel. You did a great job there. Um, let's talk about some training options. Um, if you've some of y'all may be new, but then I see some names on here that I have worked with before. Y'all aren't new Edgeforians, but I'm so glad you're joining with us anyway. Um, maybe you can teach us something um, if, if we forget or say the wrong thing. Um, we do lots of free trainings. We do lots of webinars like this one today. Um, you can actually access a lot of our old webinars. Joel's got it pointed down there in under trainings and um, webinars there. Um, in addition to these free things that we do for everyone that could apply to, to almost all districts, um, we do offer some personalized training. And so you see there our web training and our on-site training. Um, we do um, offer those with our awesome group of trainers. Um, we do charge a little money for those, so to cover our costs and um, the travel and all that good stuff. But I will tell you, I'm sure if anybody's on this call that has had a day of training with one of our trainers, it probably changed a lot for them. <laughs> um, they got their opportunity to ask as many questions as they wanted. And we really, really advise this either on site or doing a web training like we're doing right now. Um, especially if you're new to the position and perhaps you weren't trained from the person before you or you're brand new, it is a very good investment to, and I'm not just saying that because I've been a trainer here for a while. I'm truly saying that, that the districts and the folks that have trained, um, have, have invested that time and um, a little bit of money in that, in the training are way more successful way, way, way more successful in their edufarianisms. Um, what's cool about our training is that we don't have standard trainings. We don't do like a scripted type thing. We'll do whatever you need us to do. 
if you want to do half a day of something and half a day of something else, um, we can typically do that. We've got our trainers are um, multi-talented and can do lots of creative things. If you want to buy, let's say, eight hours of web training and use an hour next week on helping get aware set up, or if you want an, two hours a week from then that's to do strive training with principals, you do whatever you want. We're pretty flexible and can work with you to find the best training um, for your needs. Sometimes we've gone and just done, just sat in a room with people, <laughs> just <laughs> helped. <laughs> That's right. So we've got lots of options. We also have our wonderful ESC partners um, across the state. Um, the ESCs, uh, most of them have a certified trainer that can provide assistance for you if you're purchasing through that service center or if you're um, purchasing via uh, the ESC pricing. Um, a lot of the uh, service centers are doing conferences actually very soon. We're sending out an email tomorrow with all these upcoming dates. There's literally like five in the next three weeks. Um, Joel, you want to go ahead and go into yeah. the help if you don't mind while you're there? Just I'll show you one page. It's still being, it's being updated, so it's not accurate 100%. But go into training and webinars and then upcoming events in the top right-hand corner. I think Felicia's working on, oh, she updated 34 minutes ago. So those have some links to the events. We just have the ones for the upcoming, like the next month or so. Typically, these are free and open to anyone and everyone. People have traveled to come to those, especially if you're new. Um, they're a good way to meet other people and to experience um, some overall big picture of Eduphoria um, from not only Eduphoria trainers, but service center trainers and all that good stuff. So. And, and district staff and great Oh, networks. and districts. Yes. Thank you, yeah. Eloise. That's right. Our best presentations are when districts present. So all of you that are new Eduphorians, next year we'll see you presenting at your local Eduf um, ESC um, conference. Or even at a webinar with us. Oh, absolutely. You know what? Way back when, way back when, Joel yes. was a <laughs> guest presenter with me <laughs> for, right. for a Wednesday webinar back in the day, probably before we even called them Wednesday webinars. And so you're right, Eloise, that's right. And if you have some great ideas, we'd love to share them. This is a great avenue to do this. You don't even have to leave your desk. It's an awesome way to do that. So, um, Lots of good information on the training and webinars page. All right, what's next? We're gonna talk about our uh, district management, just some of the things that we're gonna be doing for setup. I think this is Eloise's part, so I'm gonna hand it over to her. She's gonna talk about just some basic setup for the uh, setup for the startup of the school year, some things that need to be done and uh, just things that you can check in your settings. Uh, this is usually things that are done before the start of school. Like we said, some districts are impacted by different environmental factors that have taken place this year. So maybe these haven't been done, but this is a good time to kind of check on those settings to make sure you have everything you need. Before I proceed, Michelle, would you like to share what our banner is for since these are our new Eduforians? Absolutely. We do put, that's a great thing, Eloise. This banner up here at the top, um, if you're still on site, if your district is still on site, you won't see this, but um, every other user uh, should or system administrator depends on who we um, assign it to. Anyway, those banners are typically very, very important things that we want everyone to know. Um, it's usually like if there's an outage or something like that, like sometimes every once in a while, like if our phones and our support system have gone down before for 30 minutes, we've put a banner up there. If we're going to have an outage in the evening, I know we've done that once before, but that's a very important uh, banner and we can use, we can turn it on for different folks, but um, if you're seeing it, you're most likely a system administrator. We, we do sometimes do it for all users, but yeah. Great, Eloise, thanks for the reminder. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and go into our management and just go over a couple of things um, we call housekeeping or making sure that you take care of a you know, very common question at the beginning of the year. I can't see this, I can't see that. You need to make sure that your calendar is set up. And for some 
school districts that have more than just your two term cycle and you need additional help on how to set that up, you can certainly reach out to us. Um, sometimes we have some districts that have the nine week and the six weeks running side by side with the high school. So that's something you'd reach out to us and we'd be able to assist you with. Um, another thing on here that you do also, that you are able to do is manage your users. Um, as you become more familiar with our application, there are many other features that we offer to help make things work better for the school district. Um, there's AD Sync and things of that nature under our directory services. So if you're not too familiar at this time and once you start getting a little more familiar with things, you reach out either to our support or to our training team and we'll guide you through that. This would be the place where you're able to manage your users And you just generally go through the general tab, make sure all the information's in there. In all probability, it, unless you're a totally new school district that really needs assistance in the implementation portion of it, this has already been set up. But um, if the teacher is not linked, you will need to find out if the teacher is coming through your student information system on your rosters. So there's just a little more in-depth information that is required on your part when you're getting those questions from your campuses. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Michelle? Before I go to... No, keep going. You keep going. Okay. You're doing great. Okay. Uh, one of the other things that I always like to recommend to the Eduforians being new to a school district is to print your roles report. Um, Many times, many districts, I'm guilty of this. I did it at my previous district prior to getting training. I didn't know what role and right to provide a, a person that was asking. And I was doing the try this and try that. Did you get it? Did you get it? And well, now we have an awesome tool uh, on our online help. And it does have all the roles and rights to all of our applications. So this is a great place to start. If you're not sure what you've done, print your roles and rights report, then come in here and just go through it. Is this what this person should be accessing? Should they be seeing this? Should they not be seeing that? And if you'll notice, you can toggle through the spreadsheet and it has all of our applications. Do we have any questions on that, Joel? I'm not seeing any questions. Because they're awesome. They're going to be presenting with us or at our service centers next year. That's right. <laughs> um, one of the first things that you need to look out for on your course coding, uh, when you're looking at your data, it all ties back to your management portion. So there are times throughout the year that teachers change what they're teaching and their course might be tied to something else. I'm not seeing this information. This is where you're going to come into your rosters and you'll either be able to set your subject information and it'll be a little more lengthy because there's a mass change that you can do and certainly I would want to do that now. I encourage you to call in if you need assistance in new courses that have been created and maybe haven't been coded yet. Call into training and we'll reach out to you and help guide you through that. Again, you're also able to make changes by campus. Okay, maybe not demo ISD. Here you go. You're able to see that this is an ELA course and it's tied to ELA. If you have a new course, it defaults to NA. So that's when you will see a teacher, you will hear a teacher call in and say, I have so many students and my data is not reflecting that. You'd be able to come back in here and verify if it's tied to the correct subject area. Another thing to keep an eye out for is when was it last imported? This is my demo site and we haven't imported any updates for a while, but yours should reflect nightly. I think that's all I have on that tab. Anything else? Yeah, why don't you go back to um, the organization tab and 
um, did we did you go over calendars? If you did, yeah. I apologize. You did yes. go over calendars because it's really important that you have those calendars in there, including the holidays and all that good stuff. Because those count those dates affect different applications in different ways. It affects help desk when you're looking at reports. It affects the lesson planner when you're looking at actual classroom instructional days. So it is important that that calendar is set up every year and that you don't go back and delete any old years. <laughs> There's no need to do that. So um, we definitely want to make sure that your calendar is up to date. Um, and you're right, Eloise, you went over the good man, the manage users and all that good stuff. Do you all have any questions about that? I've got one question here on from Sarah that says back on the the um, the roster tab. So Eloise was talking about the um, the setting the subject information or coding courses. Um, yeah. So the question was, do the subject areas get dropped each year? No. So if you set it last year for ELA and you set it for English, it's not. It doesn't change, correct? No. The okay. problem that does that I have seen happen is if a school district in their student information system uses an old course on their student information system that is tied to ELA and they retitle it, when it's coming over through our nightly upload, it may be a math course on your student information system that's still tied to an ELA course on our end. Oh. So that's generally where I've seen some of those discrepancies. So it's really, once you do this one time, the course coding, Eloise, um, once you do it, like if you're brand new and you've done it once, you typically don't have to go back and you don't have to do this every year. Right. You just have to update any new courses or if anything's changed, you would have to kind of revisit that, correct? Especially like this, correct. This year, all the CTE courses that were added, um, depending on if they're being tied to science teaks or math teaks, uh, you're not necessarily gonna use the code of CTE. You might wanna tie that to a math or science. Oh, okay. Okay. Interesting. All right. All right. Notice there's lots of different options over here. So the person that's the roster manager has that the roster tab to be able to um, do a lot of the information for the coast. Look, I did it. Coast courting. <laughs> I did it. I laughed because Eloise did it and I just did it. Course coding um, there um, and then also managing that roster import. A lot of you access or get help about with your roster import from your service center. If you use Texas, it's usually your service center um, is the one that can help you with that import. Um, so yeah, that's that. What else, Eloise? Uh, on that, especially uh, when you mentioned uh, the service center assisting them, they are um, super busy as we are. But if it, if it goes on a little longer than necessary and you're waiting on a roster, please send us an email and we'll also do whatever we can on our end to try and expedite that because we do know how important it is. Yeah. So uh, if, if you're yeah. running into any challenges and maybe not uh, being able to hook up whenever they have time or you have time, just please include us so that we can assist you with that. Sure, sure. Well, let's go back to the organization tab since we're running good on time. Let me go ahead and talk a little bit about groups and talking about user groups right there. Just a little tidbit here. Um, so all of your user accounts um, have, every account is assigned to a school, school or department, either one. They're, they're organized the same way within here. So if you open up under this manage user groups, if you open up the schools up at the top and then click on like say Adams Middle School, you'll see all of the users that are associated with that school. Now you can print that list, but it is a way just to kind of visually see this. Remember that the users themselves can change what school they're associated with in their profile. So you have these school set, these school groups right here that are set based on their profile. And then Eloise, if you'll cl collapse the schools and you can go to the system groups based on their profile, what they set in their profile, like early elementary, these would be all the teachers that selected the option for early elementary. 
Again, it's up to them. Now, these groups are used in various applications. So you want sum up system groups in schools are changed by the user themselves. Custom groups are ones that a system administrator, someone like yourself, would keep track of and manage those. These are used in workshop. They are used in form space. Um, a lot of, but not strive or aware right now. Those, these aren't used there. It's really in some of the other applications, workshop still, and uh, like I said, form space. Even facilities and events for some workflows. So like you might have a form that has a workflow that needs to be approved by bookkeepers. So this custom group was in here and then this group has to approve the book, approve a form that comes in through bookkeepers. Now this is one that's managed by a system administrator. The user themselves cannot change them out of that group. So there's different ways you can do that. And then over on the left, there's also manage guests which several applications, workshop right now, facilities, they actually still have um, the ability to um, create guest accounts um, for uh, some limited access, if you will. All righty, um, are there questions about anything about the system management um, or anything setting that up? I haven't seen any, but I was gonna say, if you go back to that screen, Eloise, uh, back to Eduphoria, if you would show how to access your profile to make changes. Oh, yeah. Like as an individual user, that's a great idea. Yes. And so this is actually, this is in our training under Strive for the start of the school year, but there's the profile button at the very top. And we usually encourage teachers at the start of the school year to go in and to update all this information, especially if they've moved to a new campus. If you had a new school open for the school year, uh, make sure that they're on the right campus. And then this is also where they can upload a photo. The photo will appear in Strive as part of what the administrators will see when they're at the campus view. And that's where they can upload a picture right there. And then when they click next, it's going to ask them to verify their role in the district, making sure, you know, if we had a teacher that got a change in position to be a principal or instructional coach, they can make those changes there, principal or other for a role that's not there. Uh, but just making sure their role is correct and then clicking next. If it's a teacher, the next question is going to ask them what grade level they're teaching. And we encourage them to go through the list, uncheck anything that they might have taught last year that is not current for this school year for grade levels. Again, it's about sorting them into those correct groups. And then the following question for that for teachers is going to ask specific subjects. What are you teaching? We also encourage them uncheck anything that they're not teaching for the current school year and then putting in there what they will be teaching. And this is the security question. If you're, if you have electronic signatures engaged for signing documents, they will select a question from the dropdown and then put in their answer. And that'll be the answer that they put in when they click to electronically sign a document. Your childhood nickname was ABC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, that's again, another one. Yeah, go ahead. I was Sorry, just going to say, so like Michelle was showing, those custom groups, that's where it's pulling that information from. And like I said, it's a great idea for that uh, when school starts. And it can be done at any point during the year to go in and update their profile because those system groups, that's where it's pulling that information from. And when you have those staff members who are contacting you saying, I don't know why I'm getting stuff for sixth grade. I haven't taught sixth grade in a while. It's because in their profile, they haven't made that change. They have a checkbox somewhere for that grade. Um, yeah, and there, here's a great question. And Eloise, if you can go to uh, manage users, you're being our good driver today here. She is. Um, oh, geez. Just enter something. It doesn't matter what you, what is it not liking that? Oh, okay. Um, under manage users, so if you just go to any user here, somebody asked the question, if they change their profile, does it change their roles and rights? Excellent question, Sarah, excellent question. And the answer is no, for the most part. If you go to the roles tab here, and you look at the different roles 
look at the little pluses next to those roles. That means that that role is campus specific based on what the system administrator has checked and selected here. So for example, if let's say we give this person the principal role for appraise, now we'll give one that has the, yeah, there we go. Click the plus please. And it automatically looks at their profile and says, okay, it's Galvez. Well, now if this user goes in and changes unchecks Galvez and puts Johnson Elementary, it will not change their access. That would be a FERPA violation. So that's why in anything to do with evaluations and appraised drive in AWARE, those all change. Now, in some of the other apps, yeah, they could. They could be the principal set for workshop or for, well, maybe let's not use workshop as an example, maybe help desk. If they did change their profile, it would change what access they have, but they wouldn't be seeing anything that would be in violation or anything, uh, or would be a problem. So it's just, they wouldn't see what they need to see. Right. Um, so anything that has a little plus next to it are the secure roles that if they change their profile, it doesn't change those roles and rights. Great question. And, and, and as a new Edufourian, something that is real helpful, um, on our help, especially if I'm like, I'm thinking aware, um, I don't know what to give them. They want them to do something else. We have some FAQs in here that are real helpful. So um, we've got your literacy coaches, your 504. Let me get to it if I can find it. <laughs> Where is the world and right? Oh, it's down. Go down to aware management. I think I just saw it. No. There we there go. Oh, there it is. This wasn't showing. So it's also the spreadsheet, but it's it gives you some FAQs. So you're able to, whom would I give this type of access? So you're able to read through them and see if it's something that, and if it's something that's not, that maybe it's a teacher, department head, and you want to escalate their access to help do something else with the authorization of the, their leadership, and you can't find something in here, just send in a ticket and we can help you with that. Awesome. Yeah, we've, we've, and there's a lot of suggestions there, like on that Strive spreadsheet she was just at, that does give you some suggestions of who would see this. The really the main ones that you need to be very cautious of or aware, mm -hmm. and obviously Strive for evaluations. Um, and who needs to see what. So those are the ones you want to be cautious. And don't just go check all the roles. Don't just give yourself everything because you think you need it. The best is when somebody checks everything and they also check the option that says deny access. That's my favorite. And you're like, well, you just gave yourself everything and then you denied everything. So, you know, it's one of those fun things. All righty. Well, let's go ahead and move on to forethought. And if y'all have any other questions, we can do that. Eloise, if you want to give me I can um, make it presenter. You can make it, send it to me. So then I just sent it to you. Thank you. Hang on. It's not being my friend. I, hear no, you clicking. I don't know what it's showing. I really don't know what it's showing right there now. There we go. It's showing. What's it showing? It's showing your desktop and <laughs> your okay, window. Okay. Well, I don't want that. <laughs> no, it had, it had your window on it. Okay. There we go. All righty. There you go. All right. So let's talk a little bit about forethought as an edgeforian. We're not going to go to a full forethought training. My goodness, we'd be here for a while. <laughs> but a couple of things that are really important that I want you to keep track of or um, for forethought, because what you what does happen in forethought does affect a little bit for aware. There are a few roles in uh, in forethought. Curriculum manager, principal, and lesson plan viewer. And then see that denied access. See, there's somebody that could, you just, oh, I'll check everything. Curriculum manager can do and see everything. Principal just sees the lesson plans for their school. Lesson plan viewer can see more lesson plans um, at um, additional schools, at all schools, actually. So um, curriculum manager has a, it's a very important role, can do and see everything that needs to be done in forethought. You can manage the course tree. 
There's lots of online help, videos, and things like that. So your actual course tree, your learning standards, and then all of the activities. Um, the most important thing I would say is making sure that your courses have the right set of TEKS. And this is always one of those fun things that school district districts get to do and Edufordians get to do. Um, but making sure that you have the newest, latest, and greatest TEKS, not only for forethought, but also for aware. So that if somebody is teaching sixth grade math, that they have the right TEKS for their lesson planner. And if they're making a test and aware for sixth grade math, that they have the right TEKS to align their test items to. So we can look here in this course right here and see that um, the sixth grade math, they're here. But here's the fun things. What shows up here in forethought is what they see in forethought. But what shows up here, what's checked in this little guy, in this little box here on the options tab, that's what help tells aware what to do. So that's some troubleshooting tips for you. If you have the wrong teaks, you have to go to forethought to manage those. Um, and uh, there's some great videos in the help. I'm going to go ahead and go to that because that's more, that's uh, not there. Oh, good grief. We have Active Directory now, so now we internally, so now we can't, we, that's why we get those fun screens. In Forethought, under the curriculum, there's some great things right here. There's the updating the CTE TEKS, there's shortcuts for entering, there's even more articles on updating. There's an older one here. This is the oldest one, the updating the standards in Texas, but then your updating your CTE ones has directions and videos. Um, for that. So that's kind of the important thing for forethought to keep track of um, is, is really the TEKS. You don't have to do anything necessarily for a lesson plan for a teacher to start their lesson planner. Um, they can set up their lesson plans. There's lots of videos on that, how to set it up. And then for principals to view them, they just have to have that principal role um, and can go from there. So that is very, very basic for forethought. Um, if y'all have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. You've got three people ready to answer. Um, Joel, I'm going to go ahead and pass this back to you. And Alrighty. And looks like I've got it. So I'm going to cover Strive. Uh, just information for the setup to Strive. And if you're new as an Eduforian, just letting you know, um, Strive is pulling everything from Appraise. So when we first talked about Strive rolling out, we started talking about it back in January. Uh, we actually were able to show mock-ups and have conversations with superintendents and all sorts of people at all the different conferences and the service center events. So we've been talking about Strive for quite a while. Uh, if you go into our help and look at our webinars, we have various webinars over the course of the year about the release of Strive and what it would uh, entail. But it really, it's pulling in the same uh, setting configuration look as what was in Appraise. So if I was actually in Appraise, it would just say Appraise here at the top, but it's the same configuration options and menus in both of them. And it's pulling the things that were set up in Appraise into Strive. And so like the evaluation templates, when you click on there, it's got what are the reflection documents, the walkthrough documents, and any of those documents that were used last year will appear inside of here, the walkthrough documents as well, uh, everything that is pulling in from the previous system. And all of these templates, they can be clicked on, updated, usually if it says like 2016 on it, we've been encouraging people to go in there. You can click on each template. You can take out the date for it, update that date, and make sure all your template settings are up to date. And that's the title here. It's also work. I can tie it to the specific framework I have. We're going to have a webinar coming up pretty soon where we're going to detail how you can actually edit your templates and tag each specific question type um, as having a dimension tied to that question. 
I'm not going to get into it now because we just don't have all the time for it, but just know we have an upcoming webinar. We're going to be showing how to tag dimensions into all of the assessment uh, the evaluation templates so that when you're doing reporting later you'll be able to see more detailed information specific by question for each evaluation. We also have our different appraisee types and uh, most districts are going to have just their basic teacher, their uh, principal may be in there, those may be the two, but again we've built Strive to accommodate any type of appraisee type. And so it could be something that you're doing over the course of the year. This is where you would have conversations with your HR department, staff development people, curriculum people to see about what types of appraisal types you might consider adding for the next school year. It's nothing to really rush into for this first year, but you can start having those conversations to see about making various appraisal types and then customizing those. And then whenever an appraisal type is created, uh, you're able to tie it to that framework and then you can define the evaluation process and most districts they're just going to have default here but when you actually define the steps of the evaluation process you can tag the specific documents that you have from your evaluation templates to that step in the process let me move this over a little bit and so in here when I have a, a step that I've created by going up here and creating the steps are the blue and the green are the tasks. When I click on a task, I can attach a specific document or I can do goals or I can set an SLO goal here. But when I click on document, it brings in my evaluation templates and then I can tag those specific templates to that step. And this is what's gonna help my staff who are appraised using this process. It's gonna help them see where they are overall in the process. They'll be able to see the due dates for when all their documentation is due. They can see how many will be required for the year. And all of that is set up in the appraisal type of Strive, selecting or creating a new appraisal type. And then once you're in there, creating each of the steps and tasks that will occur for that ap appraisal. And so if I just go over here to a campus view and I click on one of my teachers here. When I go in as that teacher, I can see that appraisal process with the goal setting that I had put in. And then this is where I as an appraiser can come and select those templates that I selected as part of that process. And again, we have a lot of training on this. We're answering questions about setting these up. If you have questions about that, you can contact us and we'll help you go through it. This is also where you can access the Eduforia community, and it's got all the various forms in here. We always say whenever you access Eduforia community in whichever app you're in that has Eduforia community, especially if you haven't been in there in a while or it's your first time in there, you want to click on this and then click on this refresh button. And what that will do is it's going to refresh all the documents. It takes a few minutes to push through, but it's going to pull in any updated or new documents submitted by the community and the community is made up of districts and so as people are creating these different types of forms they have the ability to share them to the community and then make them available for other districts to click on and if it's a form you like maybe you want to customize it a little bit you can import that template into your system and then that gives you control to change it for how you want. And then just under general options here, just making sure the options that you need for your appraisal process are set up. This includes the notifications, the emails that your appraisers will receive. If you're not seeing that Eduforia community uh, button, you want to uh, uncheck this one. This is disable access to the Eduforia community. And that's actually in all of the applications. Some districts uh, turn that off. Or, and they want to turn it back on, they can uncheck that here. If it's your, if you're a T-Test district, Texas district, using T-Test and T-Pest, and you have not set up your frameworks, you can click a button right here. If it's grayed out, it means it's already been selected, but that would create those frameworks for you for T-Test and T-Pest. It brings in the dimensions for both of those. And then your T-Test and T-Pest documents would be your sample documents for the first time you're initiating using 
those uh, evaluation templates. It just brings in a few from the uh, Eduphoria community, the ones that are like the 2016, I think it's 2016 sample T-test self-assessment rubric goals and assessment. So it brings those documents in for you. Are there any questions on Strive that I'm showing y'all? No. No. I answered one of them. Oh. Well, she asked what happens to the templates once the due dates are passed. I said nothing. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Those due dates that are put in when you do your evaluation process and you put a due date for any type of step or task in the system, that due date doesn't lock anything. It doesn't tell someone, oh, you can't do this anymore. It's really just kind of a reminder to let you know this is going to be due by this date, but it, it doesn't lock anything. It doesn't prevent people from still accessing those uh, documents. Joel, you might also want to mention on um, the updating existing process instances, if there are any changes that are made. That's correct. That's a good point. So anytime that you make changes uh, down here, I always recommend you want to hit update, especially if you change like the spelling or anything. Uh, you want to update the information. It will update in the view here. When you save, it saves all the changes that you made to the entire process. And then this update existing process instances is what pushes it out to the rest of the users. And it's one of those things where it just takes it a moment to push it through. And if you're like a quick, I call myself like a quick, fast clicker, where I need to see the changes immediately. Sometimes those changes don't appear quite immediately, but if you use the refresh button in your browser, it will it will make it appear once that has happened. So just know it's it's not as fast as our clicking needs sometimes. So that's why that refresh button is so helpful in the browser is because if I did push this out and it hasn't caught up to me, you can just hit that refresh button in the browser and it'll it'll show those changes as they occur. So, Joel, there's a question in here that says, how do the principals access the templates? So when a principal is in, when they're in the evaluation process that is set up on the management side, and if I'm a principal and I go into a teacher and I'm going to be creating their walkthrough, if I'm in this card view, I can start with this plus button right here. If I'm in list view, I can click on the plus button on the side of the type of appraisal type that I'm evaluating. And it's the same for each one. It just takes you right to the evaluation tab for that user. And then when you're in that evaluation tab, scroll down to the steps that the principal, the appraiser will be doing. Teachers are gonna be setting their goals. So the appraiser will not have the plus button. Only the teacher has the plus button to create those goals. On TPES, the principal has their uh, goals, if it's set up for TPS for them to do goal setting, they'll have that action to be able to create a goal. But for creating the walkthrough or the uh, observation forms, they simply click on that to open the, the template choice. And it is a choice if there's multiple forms that have been selected in the process. So they can select the form they're going to use, enter the information about the classroom, select the start date, making sure that's correct. When they get to start time, it's by hour increments and then it's by five minute increments. Uh, this was put in to kind of help save time just to be able to click on something. So if it's 217, I can either choose 215 or 220 and then uh, putting that information in there for when it will, um, let me see, let's have this one go to about 245. And then I can create that evaluation document. It's going to pull that document in. The the other question is, if if you were asking Cynthia, I'm not sure if you were, but to actually build and edit the templates, mm -hmm. principals don't have access to do that. They don't have the evaluation Correct. templates tab. That's the appraisal administrator, the Strive administrator, and I, most districts do not allow or shouldn't you shouldn't let too many people build them because it's just a little bit more than they need to do so typically one or two people are building those so just making sure Correct. now the other question she just asked is why are the goals under evaluations and not under goals ah it's a great question wait which one was that uh go to any of those teachers 
it's because I'm sure that <clears throat> oh why are the goals under goals well there's there's she's saying why are the goals under evaluations and not under goals oh that is a good question so the goals area was created for the teacher or the user to go in to manage their goal to see it along this awesome timeline the white Indicators are the actions that they put in that they're going to try to accomplish before the end of the goal. And this lets them kind of see how they're doing along the progression of the timeline of the entire goal statement. The evaluation tab is the evaluation process, and goal setting is part of that process. And inside of this, there is an ability, and I guess it's not in my demo account, but there's an at, attach a goal button that appears here where teachers can actually pull in the goal. We have it in the, let me pull it up in the the uh, help side in just a second. But it's a attach the goal. They can bring their goal over as part of this process. And so it is, it, it depends on when the evaluation process was, was uh, created by a district. So when they first had it, it was set for a default and a default. And usually in that first step, it was all of the documents were there. The goal setting, the walkthroughs, the summative conference, everything is just like in one default step. But then when you were able to go in to define each of the, the steps and then the tasks, the goals that were created in appraise and created before that evaluation process, those goals resided over here on this side. So in the evaluations, oh, I know why it's not showing. It's because I'm logged in as an administrator. Uh, in the evaluations area, when the user, the teacher goes in, they can bring that goal over using that attach button to bring it into the process that was set up. So it's a way to still keep the goals here in the goals tab to monitor their goal access, but it's also a way for them to take a goal that might have been created previous to the process and merge it over to be part of whatever that requirement is. So maybe there is a requirement for a district to have three professional goals and a teacher has created two of them in here. They'd be able to pull those two goals over into that evaluation process now. Awesome. All right. Well, we have about two minutes. All right, cool. Mm -hmm. the, I yeah. Think I think, timing. Yeah, the last thing that we have here, uh, we want to make sure – I'm going for my present button. We want to make sure that you know that you can sign up for updates. And we have email blasts that go out, and uh, this is how you would sign up to be part of that email blast. It's on our news page. It's eduphoria.net slash news, and it's on the right column. And there's the sign up for updates. You want to put in your school district email address, your name and the school district you belong to, and then hit subscribe. And that will add you to our mailing list. So whenever we have, like Michelle was saying, we, we have that banner that we can post things if phones are down or if something's happening that's inside of our applications. But this is more about news going on with the company that we want to share. It's links to our, it's a newsletter that usually comes out once a week where we post about things that are going on, upcoming webinars, um, any type of updates that are coming, uh, where we're going to be at conferences. So everything, I like how it says up here on the site, it says things relevant to the Eduphoria universe. And as an Eduphorian, you are part of that universe with us. And so this is a way to sign up to receive those news items. And also, giving a plug and a shout out to our social media, we are on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And they all can be connected using at Eduphoria. And when we post on one of them, I believe it posts on all of them. But Instagram is pretty amazing. There's a lot of insider pictures being posted of our offices and when we're at conferences. And Eddie, our mascot, when he's being shown at conferences, we try to post information there. So we do have our updates, information, news items, everything that we want to share with you, we post through these updates, so you can sign up there. Are there any other questions coming in? Well, 
think we're good. It has been great talking to all y'all, and I know I'm not the only one who's going to say it, but welcome to the world of Eduphoria, all of our Eduphorians. And just know, we hope you get the message from this, that we are really here to help you. And if you contact us, we're going to do our best to make sure that you get everything you need to make sure the implementation of Eduphoria and its products are good for you and your district. So thank you for joining us. We know it's busy this time of year. Thanks for taking the time out and joining us in this webinar today. Awesome. Thank all you. Right. Bye, everyone.